Welcome to Real Chalk, a Shrug Collective production. Mike Bledsoe here, stoked to be launching this network so that we can introduce you to amazing content providers like Ryan Fisher. We'll be posting new shows every weekday, so be on the lookout. As a thank you for listening, Thrive Market has a special offer for you. You get 60 bucks of free organic groceries, plus free shipping, and a 30-day trial. Go to thrivemarket.com slash realchalk. This is how it works. Users will get 20 bucks off their first three orders of $49 or more, plus free shipping. No code is necessary because the discount will be applied at checkout. Many of you will be going to the store this week, so just hit up Thrive Market today. Go to thrivemarket.com slash realchalk to get set up. Enjoy the show. All righty, kids. Yaya here coming at you with a brand new episode of the Real Chalk podcast on the Shrugged Collective this week, Ryan and I sat down on his couch with one of his oldest buddies, Brian Borstein from CrossFit PB, one of the gyms that Ryan worked at during his time when he was living down in San Diego and just starting out his career in the CrossFit world. So we chat a little bit, bit about the history that the two have together and then a lot about just training, pacing, how training has evolved over the years, especially CrossFit and where Brian sees this whole thing going He is also huge on personal client programming, so he has a lot of uh, online clients that he programs for. So we dive into that, not only how to write programming, but also how to provide the greatest value to athletes that are following your workouts. Fish and I literally just got back. I must have walked into the door maybe 30 minutes ago from Paleo FX, our very first event with the entire Shrug Collective, and we had an absolute blast this entire weekend. Great mix of having fun and getting our work done, and there is so much just amazing content that's coming your way on the Shrug Collective uh, right here on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you guys are listening, but also on their website, ShrugCollective.com, on the YouTube channel. Uh, follow me at Yaisview and Ryan at Ryan Fish on Instagram. And there's going to be a lot of cool stuff coming your way that I'm really, really excited for. I'm going to stop yapping, let you guys jump into the episode. Hope you guys enjoy it. Oh. <laughs> All right, kids, we're live, back on Fish's couch, uh, sitting down with Brian Borstein. Fish knows him from way, way back when he was coming up in San Diego, just starting CrossFit, and then you were working at his gym, correct? I was not working at his gym. I wanted to be part of any gym that would actually let me come in and work out. <laughs> oh, <okay>. so, <laughs> <there you> yeah. <laughs> this was like right around the time when I lost everything that I had, and I was just trying to reach out to anybody. Like, I really, would, I wanted a job with, with you, you guys did, at first, Yeah, you right? had just come from the other gym, the un, the one we won't speak about. I think and we can talk about it. We can talk about it? Okay. Uh, and where, who was programming all uh, all hero workouts all the time. Yep, yeah. And, well, I've heard uh, this story before. Yeah, so this, some of you guys know, like, a little bit about my story, where I, I started at this gym where I just didn't agree with the programming, and it just, it, like, really evolved into just hero workouts every single day. And then it turned into people being, like, really burned out and it's actually why Brian's here and why we're on this podcast we're going to talk about programming we're going to talk about different avenues to get into and how everything's evolved um and then we'll talk about evolved which is Brian's training system at some point oh yep. nice little plug. yeah I love that <laughs> that was a great little slide in there <laughs> so yeah we had all that going on and I quit my job and things went downhill for me and a lot of you guys know and um just was at the bottom of the bottom and then I sent an email to this guy here, and I was like, hey guys, I just, I just want to uh, reach out to you guys and see if I can do anything for you. I can shadow coach or do whatever. And um, the first time I walked in, we can talk about that experience when you guys met me, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so so Fish walks into the gym, never seen this guy before. Um, I remember Anders immediately looked up your resume when you sent it over, and he was like, oh, this dude's been in the Olympic training team, and like he's been a helicopter pilot. And he's been coaching at this other gym for a while and blah, blah, blah. And he walks in and looks like this just like muscled bowling ball, like more Jack than Noah Olsen. The muscle hamster. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think the first workout we ever did with you in the gym, you walked in and it was DT. And I remember at the time I did that thing in like seven and a half minutes or something. Loden did it in like 630 and we, were, we thought we were hot shit. 
And then Fish comes in and does it in like 3.36, I think was the time. And I never even done like it that. before. It never time. done it. Did like the first two rounds unbroken. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I do it. Like no one knew any it. better. It was like 2010 at the time. No one knew any better. And uh, we just knew he'd be a good fit to hang out with us at that point. So yeah, I started spending a lot of time in there. <clears throat> and then from there, um, that was when... I actually found the first person who I'd be sleeping on their couch, Erin. Erin, <laughs> dude, what a nice girl she is, huh? Yeah, she hooked me up, and <laughs> when everything was at its bottom, I got to hang out on her couch for a little bit. Did you have to strip for her to sleep on the couch? So the stripping, <laughs> <laughs> the stripping thing came after, actually. A lot of you guys know about the stripping situation. I think you actually got to see one of my routines during New Year's Eve. My routine? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did have the New Year's Eve and the New Year's Day pub crawl. I think oh, it, yeah. that might have been where it came out, or it came out as well there. but At the Shore Club. I the was, Shore Club, yeah, exactly. I was doing my strip routine for all these girls at the Shore Club. And it worked. And it did work. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's talk about you a little bit, like how you got into CrossFit, fitness, all that stuff. You can start wherever you want, like take it all the way back. Cool. And then we'll go from there. So ninth grade, high school. I'm a, I'm a little kid, haven't hit puberty yet, and uh, the one fight I ever got in in my life was because some kid in ninth grade decided that uh, he'd call me the Pillsbury Doughboy. I wasn't even fat. I just had <laughs> baby fat on me. Kids and are I, so dude, fucking Dude, so mean, mean dude. right? Totally. So we ended up throwing down in chemistry class, <laughs> and, uh, and we both got detention for it, but literally that day, I was like, I need to get bigger, I need to get stronger. And uh, I started going online, started researching training, and um, I played... How did the fight go? Oh, man, it was like two blows, and then the teachers broke it up. Oh, it, was, right, it was a really stupid pansy fight. Um, nobody even really got, like, hit that hard, you okay. know? <laughs> um, but we had this little, like, universal gym uh, in our high school. It was a shitty private school with not much of an athletic team or anything, but, you know, I'd do, like, three sets of ten bench press, three sets of ten rows three sets of ten whatever everything just kind of in a circuit didn't really know much better um eventually the first real kind of structured training that i came across was hit not like high intensity interval training but high intensity training which is kind of like you know one set to failure just work as hard as you can on one set per per movement and you get the most benefit from that so this is kind of where my view on not necessarily needing all the volume in the world to train really started to come to prominence. And that's one of my big things now is just do a little bit less, make it a little bit higher quality and get the most out of it that way, you know. Um, so I played basketball in high school. Training with weights was, uh, was one of the things that allowed me to actually compete with people that were much bigger, taller than me. And um, I was decent at basketball, I guess. Um, Went into college, exercise phys, uh, same as fish. Or kinesiology. Whatever kinesiology. Whatever you guys were thinking it as. Exactly, with uh, sports management as well. And uh, just kind of continued lifting, started programming for friends in college that just didn't really know what else to do. Um, and then after college, fell into the corporate world. It was miserable. Went to sit at a desk every day for three plus years. Um, getting nauseous just thinking about that yeah it was terrible I, I think mean, it's crazy people uh, who go to school for kinesiology or exercise physiology you think you're going to come out and have this dope job and a, a lot of people out there if you guys are listening right now like when you guys are in that career field like in college you're like really setting yourself up for like a very very small piece of career opportunities yeah I think my biggest hindrance was I started looking at jobs in that field and everything was like $28,000 a year or like, and, you know, internship unpaid with like yeah. an opportunity to potentially become employed. And, and potentially uh, make $28,000. Right, exactly. <laughs> so then I sit down and I'm like, okay, I can be like a government contracting here and I'll be making like 60 to 65 right out of college, like not a bad gig and whatever. Yeah. I'll just like do programming on the side. So that's kind of what I did. I trained on my own typical bodybuilding splits type stuff, five days a week, chess one day, back the next day, that sort of thing. Um, but it always took a back seat to, you know, feeling like there was more out there. In 2009, Anders moves out to San Diego and, uh, it was one drunk night in Vegas. We're there for like a bachelor party or something. And he turns over to me and he's like, dude, do you want to start a CrossFit gym? And I didn't even remember this at all. 
And a couple of days later, we get back from Vegas, and he's like, hey, dude, remember when like we talked about opening the gym? And I'm like, no, not really, but sort of. And uh, I was like, yeah, sure, let's do it. So we walked down Garnett Ave, the main drag in Pacific Beach in San Diego, and we noticed this like record store going out of business. We walk in, we take some measurements, we talk to the landlord, didn't really think much of it. Went to a coffee shop, started jotting down some ideas on some business plans and stuff like that. The landlord calls us and he's like, hey, you can have the place, but you need to sign in the next couple weeks. So we spend the next few weeks writing a business plan from our corporate jobs, get some funding from a couple different sources. And the next thing we know, it's April 2010 and we own a CrossFit gym. So that was, uh, that's how it all started. And uh, when did you come down? July 2010, maybe? The summer? Something like that. But it was, we were relatively new at the time. It was like 2012. I don't know, bro. I feel like we were still just getting started. Maybe it was a, a few. Uh, it's like next eleven. Year. Maybe it was eleven. Two thousand eleven. Were we full time at the gym at that point, or were we still working other jobs? No, you guys are both full time. You okay. were both telling me how you had your corporate jobs yeah. and you hated it. Anders told me the same. So I remember you guys both having corporate jobs, and then I remember asking you guys like how you started, but I thought it was super interesting because you guys made a bunch of window paint and said free CrossFit, right? <laughs> yeah. We, we ran the gym for free for a month and a half. And it was literally just try as many classes you want, come for free for an entire six weeks. Oh, and I think we put 220 people through the gym in six weeks. And then July 1st, we were like, okay, you either sign up or get the fuck out. And 33 people signed up. That's pretty cool. So we started a gym with 33 members and that was almost break even at that point. I was just going to ask you that too because especially during that time like 2009, 2010 there were CrossFit gyms opening up like every single day right so besides that like I really like that the whole like free CrossFit idea yeah. what were some other things you guys were doing that separated you a little from the other stuff because especially in San Diego too there have to be gyms like on every corner right? You guys were the first one. No right? yeah so that's actually completely wrong so oh. in 2010 we were like the third or fourth CrossFit gym in the San Diego area there was Invictus there was CrossFit San Diego there was what is now Bear Republic was CrossFit East Village. And that's where Anders and I actually started training together because they had open gym. And I was like, so when Anders first moved out here, I was anti-CrossFit. I didn't even know that I wanted to do it really. I just thought it was only Metcons. I didn't know yeah. there was a strength component to it or anything. Cause I'd look at the daily wad and it would be like Fran, Cindy, like all these different things. And I was like, I don't want to just do cardio. I want to lift. So we went to East Village where they had open gym and we would do like our deadlifts, then we would do a Metcon. Then like, you know, the next day it'd be like power cleans and squats and then a Metcon. And that's where I kind of evolved some of my ideas about training and how important incorporating strength work is and stuff like that. So it was a, it was a process though. Like um, it took me a little while of actually kind of doing CrossFit and doing it my way or the way that I wanted to do it before we actually kind of came up with the idea of starting our own gym and then being able to program it exactly how we wanted to. So um, like anybody starting a CrossFit gym, we didn't really know what proper training was either. You know, mm -hmm. I think one day we programmed CalSU for the gym. <laughs> like, CalSU, if, if you don't know, it's 100 thrusters for time at 135. Which now is like not a big deal. Which is not a big deal, but back then it really ruined people. Yeah. I remember doing it one day and like, I think Anders crawled out of the gym and puked at like 60 reps and then came back in and completed the workout yes. and no one knew anything about pacing or strategy. So it was like, you come out the first minute and you do 15 thrusters because <laughs> that's what you're capable of. Yeah. And then the next minute you're like doing three because yeah. that's also what you're capable and of. And people were doing like one <laughs> and then the five And then burpees. five burpees and then some minutes you just do burpees. Yeah. Um, so no one really knew, right? Like we were just like hard workouts are the key and there really wasn't any process of hey how do we create better athletes it was just kill yourself every day and come back and do it again the next day well then the crossfit game started happening and then from there everyone saw rich froning and they're like oh i have to work out six times a day right. for me to be as good as rich froning and i think that really ruined i think rich froning is <laughs> personally responsible for ruining crossfit oh my god <laughs> jesus <laughs> It was, it was that's like a huge honestly, statement. that's a great, a huge, huge. I statement, mean, as but. as as good as he is for the sport, that video when he came out and everybody was like, "Oh my god!" Like 
Because I didn't know either. Like, I would work yeah. out in the gym and, like, and then I would think that was it. And I would be, like, excited to work out the next day and whatever. And right. then um, and then I'd, you know, everyone says recover and this and that. And then all of a sudden you watch this video and you're like, oh, that's why he's so good. He's doing this and that and this and that and this and that. He works it eight times a day, yeah. So everyone went from working out one hour a day to six hours a day. And then that's when all the injuries started. That's when, like, over-programming started. That's when... Especially People back then, gyms. everybody's goal was still to make it to the games. Like yeah. everybody that walked into a CrossFit gym wanted to go to regionals, wanted to go oh, to the yeah. games. So they all I can't wanted wait to get into all these things right now. I'm so excited. There's this so is many actually, topics. yeah, this is actually like a really good kind of um, transition into one of the things that I wanted to talk about, which is like when Froning worked out six times a day, he wasn't actually working out six times a day. And people looked at it and they're like, like I remember specifically one of the movies. It was like the life of Rich Froning or a day in the life of Rich Froning. And one of his workouts was three squat cleans on the minute for 20 minutes at 185. Yeah, which and for so, him is nothing. Which is nothing! Right, this is exactly it. Or like 10 thrusters on the minute at 95 for 10 minutes or something like that. Which to him is like, I use the analogy of like, it's like a basketball player shooting free throws. Yeah. It's literally like taking 100%. zero effort and you're just practicing technique. And yet people look at that and they're like, oh, three cleans on the minute at 185? I could do that. And suddenly, but for them, one eighty five is ninety percent. Exactly, sixty percent. Yeah. Right? No, exactly. So what people need to be doing is doing it at one fifteen, yeah, exactly. or at one thirty five at most. And if you did that, then working out six times a day isn't actually working out six times a day. It's working out once or twice a day with like a lot of practice. Yeah, exactly. And this yeah. is one thing we talk about on the podcast all the time is that I think one of the biggest problems right now in CrossFit gyms is kind of like that training and practice. That people don't see the difference in there anymore, right? Yeah, exactly. They go in and they train every single day and they compete every single day. They're competing with everybody else in the class. They're competing with everybody else on the leaderboard. They're competing with the score they got on the same workout six weeks ago or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. But no one really ever goes in and just does 15 double unders on a minute or does a rope climb or works on their clams or like just because you do a hundred chest for pull-ups as fast as you possibly can that's not going to make you better at chest for pull-ups absolutely pull not right yeah. so i think people nowadays i think it's starting to people are starting to understand that like okay what i'm doing isn't working i gotta slow down a little bit but especially back then like no one was doing stuff like that exactly and if they were i think the injuries would be significantly less and people would be better at movement. Yeah. I mean, even something like five chest of our pull-ups every 30 seconds for 10 minutes or something, you look at that and you still did a hundred chest of our pull-ups. Yes, exactly. But, but you did it so much smarter, reps. right? They were great reps. Your technique Absolutely. was great. Your kip was being worked on. The timing of the movement, your breathing patterns, like all these different things. And the one thing that is super important to me, I feel like, is if you're able to move perfectly at any given movement, let's say your snatch and chest of our pull-ups, wall balls, whatever it is, as you get more and more tired in the workout, everybody, all of us, our efficiency and the movement is going to decline just a little bit, mm -hmm. right? But if you start at perfect and you get tired, then you end at above average still, mm -hmm. right? If I start at, ooh, my movement is like slightly <laughs> above average and then you get tired, you end at fucking shit show. Like that's the, yep. end, of, that's the yep. end result. Yep. No, I agree 100%. You're inefficient. You yep. cause injuries to occur. Your shoulder girdle gets smashed. Exactly. Yep. And at this time, this is like when people are getting really addicted to the sport. So then they think that the next evolution for them is to own a gym so they can train more. <laughs> Dude. Which yeah. actually does not equal It's kind of the opposite <laughs> effect. <laughs> but it, even if it is the opposite effect, what you think is going to happen is you're going to get to train more, but you also get excited to put your programming for the people. So then you give them this ridiculous competitive programming that no one can really do. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of scaling going on. Or maybe you don't have coaches that are good enough to even show proper scaling. So then you get people who can start getting pissed. And then when people get pissed, they don't have a good experience. Then they tell someone that they tried CrossFit and they didn't have a good experience. And then that person tells someone that they did CrossFit mm -hmm. and they didn't have a good experience. And then all 100%. of a sudden now CrossFit is not a dope program to do yeah i'm gonna go do spin or i'm gonna go do orange theory or whatever because my, CrossFit gets you because hurt. my good friend told me that this is what it's like yeah it's like no 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 because coaches don't give a fuck like you said people open gyms because they want to train more and they think that the that lifestyle is going to enable them to go to the games go to regionals whatever it is right i mean you've seen me like i've had to like yell at people in class to take weight off their bar yeah for people that walk into the gym and all of a sudden it's their first day and they're doing push press at 95 which fucking is nothing but 
their back is all arched and they don't know what they're doing and they're about to drop it on their head and I'm like, dude, take the fucking weight off or walk out the door. Like, that, those are the two options. You're not getting hurt in my class. I remember there was one guy he literally had such a problem with. Oh my god, dude, it was so bad. Like, Fish had to, like, step in and be like, look, you can put, like, because I was telling him to just do the bar. Yeah. And then Fish came in and he's like, okay, you can do tens, but that's <laughs> absolutely, that's yeah, the most yeah. you could do. First day in there, like, yeah. probably finishing in front of his face every time. Like, yeah. <laughs> not clearing through, no mobility. There's so many funny things that happen. Yeah. But it's a very interesting time. That whole time period, I think, is just crazy. Like, for us, I think it's great to look back on it and be like, oh, that was such a fun time. But, man, if we were so much smarter, like, the things we would have done and, like, the athlete that I probably would have been if I was just a little bit smarter, I, I definitely fell victim to doing everything. Dude, the best story <laughs> ever is when you were, like... I went out with intention to run a 5K, and it just kept feeling good, so I kept running, yeah. and I think I just ran a marathon. <laughs> <laughs> you walked in all sweaty, you're like, what should I do now? We're like, nothing? Go home? Yeah. I was like, I think I'm going to squat. And I think I hit like a 500 pound back squat. Yeah. <laughs> and to this day, it's like what everyone always talks about. He ran a marathon and squatted 500 pounds in a day. Yeah. I mean, well, that's like a pinnacle, right? Like, yeah. that's what you want to achieve, strength and conditioning simultaneously. That was, a good, that was a good run. Speaking of running a marathon, we were talking before we started recording a little bit about your um, Olympic world record trial. Or oh, my, my, my attempted Guinness Book of World Records. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so 500 muscle-ups in a day. And originally, I set out to do 1,000. I thought that that would get me noticed. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, more is but, better, guys. More, right, is better. <laughs> more is always better. So this was also probably the first year of owning the gym. But uh, I looked up the Guinness Book of World Records, and the only record in there was max muscle-ups unbroken and at the time it was 26 and it was bar muscle-ups which now like every games athlete can do 26 muscle-ups in a row like it's not even hard but i was like you know what i'm gonna set a new record so i videoed the whole thing i created this like whiteboard with a checkbox for every five reps that i complete so that i could keep track of it and the camera would show the the board every time i completed a set and i did 500 ring muscle-ups in seven hours and 51 minutes and uh <laughs> How do you even start that? Like, how do you even break that up? That's a good question. So I did the, I did, I did the first 250 in sets of five reps. Okay. And I just did one wow. set of five every five minutes. Wow. Because I knew it was a pacing game, right? I wasn't going to try and go out and, like, kill myself. But by that, uh, by the 250th rep, I was feeling it. <laughs> and uh, oh, I'm feeling it right now. Just talking about it. I was actually not feeling great. I started at 6 a.m., and I remember Anders had to go out and buy me chocolate milk because I was just so drained. I was like, I can't stop doing muscle ups. So he, <laughs> he ran across the street and bought me chocolate milk. I chugged some chocolate milk and kept going. I did the next hundred reps in singles. I tried to do one single on the minute for a hundred minutes. Cool. So I did that. A <laughs> hundred minutes. <laughs> so then I was at 350. And then I think I did triples the rest of the way. So the last 150 were all in triples. Um, and whatever it was, it took seven hours and 51 minutes. And uh, the next day, what did you feel like? <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly, not nearly as bad as I thought it would be. Oh, wow. I had a rip in my hands and my lats were sore. But other than lat soreness and a small rip in my hands, it was way better than I thought it would be. I only took one day off. You know, it was 2010. You can't be taking days off. <laughs> One day off. <laughs> and did so, you get the world record? So Guinness Book of World Records got back to me and they said, this is not an acceptable record. Please see Max Muscle Ups Unbroken. Oh. And I was like, oh, come on. I'm trying to create. I'm trying to pave my own path here. Like, give me this credit, you know. Somehow Dave Castro heard about this and he emailed me and he was like, are you the idiot that did <laughs> 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 and uh, I was like, yeah, that was me, you know, whatever. I thought I'd at least get some love on the CrossFit site, but it wasn't meant to be. Nothing. I didn't even know he reached out to you. Yeah, or maybe I reached out to him and then he got back to me, but it was one of the two. Wow. Um, but he was aware of it because I remember he brought it up at regionals the following year. He was like, yeah, you're that idiot that did 500 muscle ups. <laughs> so he was aware. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, but no, no record to speak of. So it is what it is, you know. Well, you still got your street cred, though. Exactly, so exactly. Yeah, the sure. only idiot to do 500 muscle ups <laughs> yeah. in a day. And they're still, like, to this day, one of my favorite movements, right? Like, yeah. when Fish walked into the gym, he could barely even do muscle ups, as athletic as he is. And 
We did like 30 muscle-ups for time. I used to get so bummed because you'd always do so many more than me. It was the only workout I could ever beat fish at. So I tried to make your favorite movement. (laughs) I love I tried to make him do it all the time because I just wanted to beat him at something. So from there, now we're in probably 2000 because I think I went to regional in 2012 with you guys. Yep. That was when I got fourth. That was a great day. You had three straight years of top five. Yeah. (laughs) Which sucks. Always once put up, right? But that was always when it was only like top three made regionals. Yep. Um, then they made a top five and I got fucking sixth. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Isn't that, I remember that too. Isn't that so right. Oh my God. Dude. I know. Anyway, so now this is during a time where people are starting to get kind of smart about this stuff. And what I think is like really, really interesting for you guys out there, if you're a CrossFitter and you're a fan of CrossFit and you've been around for a while... And you're starting to see all these online programs kind of pop up. I think the first, like one of the first people to do like remote coaching was Brian. I started way long ago. Yeah, it started with you and Carly. Mm -hmm. And it was 2010, 2011. No, it must have been 2011. Um, But you're like one of the first people that I can think of in my mind that actually started that. Yeah, it was. And I made a post for you one day. I was like, "You uh, you guys need a coach one day. And then like. And then Carly signed up, and then Carly got all stoked and posted about it. And then that was when, like, Instagram was, like, starting. Yeah. I mean, You were an early adopter. I, I really wish I, like, really was into it, though. Because I would just post every once in a while. Like, it wasn't, like, every day. I didn't have any, like, strategy to it. Now it's, like... Oh, well, yeah, there wasn't, like, social media experts that tell you, like, on this day, like, content calendars, right? On this day, you're going to post about this. This day's yeah. about this. This is about this. Like, every day has to have some sort of content associated, but... Yeah, my uh, the remote coaching thing though was like ingrained in me from so long ago. Like even in college, when I was just you know pursuing exercise fizz, I was remote coaching for friends and family at the time, like around the country that just needed guidance. And I didn't know that it was remote coaching at the time. It was just me emailing them workouts and them doing them. Um, so then you came along and you needed coaching. And that was a perfect in. And then Carly came along and she made regionals after six months of doing CrossFit, which is something that you just don't see anymore. Yeah. Um, and it just kind of grew from there. And like my whole philosophy grew too, right? Like, yeah, I'm excited to talk about that. Yeah. So, so you started out doing program. So like when you had all these people come into your gym and now you're, you have this CrossFit gym, like what was the programming process going in your head right away out the gate? Did you, want, did you want everyone to just kind of make sure they get a really good sweat in and leave? Did you want people to get strong? Did you want a little bit of both? Or did you just want to just do classic CrossFit workouts? It was a mix of all of it, man. Like, I don't know. Like, as I, as I alluded to in the beginning when we were training at East Village, I always had a strong belief in strength work. And I, all, I was, you know, averse to CrossFit at first because I just thought it was all cardio. So then when we started our own gym and I realized that I could create whatever sort of programming I wanted to do, it was really cool to be able to be like, okay, well, Mondays we squat. And to this day, that is one thing that's unchanged. We squat on Mondays. And Tuesdays was generally like more of a longer Metcon. Um, Wednesdays would be some sort of focus on an Olympic lift. Thursdays was more gymnastics and cardio focus, so you get a little break from the barbell. And... Fridays generally would be some sort of deadlift um, or pull off the ground. And then Saturdays was more of like a team workout approach. And that side of things hasn't really changed much when it comes to gym programming. Yeah, I I think that sounds great. I was going to say that I like that structure a lot. That sounds good to me. I think it's important to have structure for your gym too. Like your members want to be able to see themselves getting stronger Mm -hmm. and you guys alluded to this too in your how to program podcast you did a couple weeks ago where you know you get down these four week squat cycles and members can actually see themselves getting stronger over a four week period and that's important it's really hard to see improvement on metcons because you just don't repeat the same metcon that often unless it's like a named workout that's done every six months or something like that so you have a squat program or you have like you know triples on deadlift that you do every Friday and you know every fourth week there's a deload week because you just can't tax your CNS like that but you know every Friday you're deadlifting and then you know on Wednesdays you snatch or you clean or you do some sort of combo of both and you can actually tangibly see yourself getting better um, whether it's getting more reps with the same weight or higher loading so did you have this kind of format from the beginning 
yeah, um, yeah, I would say that that was always kind of my belief system. And it's just, it's evolved over time to the point that now I'm much more, like when I program um, AMRAP type work or, or four time work, I often will do it in a, a pacing mechanism. So I was going to say, before you get into like that part yeah. necessarily, I remember talking to you when you were going through the OPT stuff. Yeah. And that was like 2013 or 14? Correct, yeah. Right? So now, now you have a couple years of gym programming, and now you're going on to something that's getting really, really popular. A lot of people kind of want to know what's going on because OPT's like starting his own training systems. And now you started something that opened up a whole different window. Yeah, exactly. In, in style of training. Because I remember I was still being trained by you. <laughs> yeah. And I remember the workouts changed significantly. And I was asking why. And you're yeah. like, oh, this is the way you want to do it. And blah, 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 blah. So let's go over what that was like and how that changed your philosophy. And then what we're doing with that now with, awesome. what, you, with what you do now. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> so the biggest change that I think came from the OPEX, OPT stuff was this focus on pacing and how you don't want to go 100% all the time. And I think for most people that are in the know that are CrossFit coaches at this point, that's kind of just an obvious thing. Like the sport has evolved to a point where you know you can't go 100% all the time. So back in 2013, 2014, it was almost unique to be like, okay, we're going to do an AMRAP five minutes. We're going to rest three. Then we're going to do an AMRAP five minutes again. We're going to rest three. We're going to do another AMRAP five. And your score is going to be the worst of the three workouts. Mm -hmm. It's the only way I could get people to pace. Because if I'm like, you know, your score is the cumulative total of all three AMRAPs, people are going to go 100% on all three AMRAPs. Yeah. You hold them back a little and you're like, okay, your score is the least of the three. And that was my first real kind of involvement with the whole pacing mechanism. I remember seeing that in the programming and I was like, oh shit, how do I do this? Yeah. Right. And by the way, think about, uh, do you remember the OCT when we programmed Three Friends? Oh yeah. So that was literally taken from that same philosophy. It was like, you're going to do Three Friends, each one is going to be on the five minutes and oh your score is your worst friend. That guess, sounds awful. Guess who won that? Fisher. Oh, what was your slowest friend? <laughs> my slowest friend, I want to say it was like 320. I was going to say 321. Yeah, and my yeah, fastest yeah. one, I did my last one in like 240. Well, but it, no, it, no, no. It was the slowest score? Or it was, was your slowest up? score, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I think I got faster, which is why everybody was freaking out. Because I was getting like, I started my first one, and I think my first one was my slowest, and okay. I went a little bit faster each time. So you won that workout with a 321 Fran, and you were able to sustain a 321 or better for all three. And right. it was a slap in the face for a lot of CrossFitters that didn't understand pacing. Like they go out there and they're like, oh, I could hold a three minute Fran forever. Until you can't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that stuff is so cool. I talk to Fish about this stuff all the time, like the OPEX, OPT stuff. Um, when I lived in Chicago, one of the guys there, regional athlete also, he then moved to Arizona. He's like one of their sponsored athletes now. Um, so I follow him on Instagram and he basically posts all his programming all day, every day, all the stuff he does. And I just think it's so cool to see someone with such like scientific approach to CrossFit, not just like, I'm going to beat the fuck out of you and you're going to feel like you're dying every single day. And we're going to hope that that's going to make you better. They have so many different standards that you have to uphold. I feel like every mm -hmm. single day. And I think me as an athlete too, as I get smarter, as I learn more about programming and understand what I'm doing, because even me, I started CrossFit later than, way later than you guys. I've been CrossFit for two and a half years now. Mm -hmm. So the CrossFit scene in general, I feel like was a lot more evolved by the time I jumped into it. But I still made the same mistakes that everybody else Of course, else did, everybody right? does. It's so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> you, just, you, got, you go so fast, you go so hard, and you go seven days a week, and you yeah. just, you know what I mean? Try and prove yourself, and then your body's kind of like, okay, dude, maybe not, right? Yeah. Maybe slow down a little bit. So I think stuff where, like, the pacing is more in the foreground... It's just so, I, I just like it so much more because I feel so much more connected to working out. Whereas if I'm doing friend as fast as I possibly can, or even a 15 minute MRAP as fast as I possibly can, there comes this time where you just kind of black out and you just kind of become a zombie, right? right, right. right? And you're just kind of like going through the motions where stuff like this, where I have to pace and you have to think and you're like, okay, I have to breathe and every rep has to be perfect. And you're so much more connected to the workout. I feel like that when I leave the gym, I feel way more fulfilled than if I just went as hard as I could, blacked out for 10 minutes, and then laid on the ground for another 15 minutes. I agree completely, man. It's like turning fitness into a cerebral sport. Yeah. 
It's like a smart man's game. It's active meditation. That's what I call totally. it. Totally. No, I, I think that's a... You should coin that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> active if you meditation. watch Froning work out... It's literally like that. He, he is not dead. Yeah, no. 100% He's not. He's leaving some stuff on the table for yeah. sure. If you watch him do... Like, when I was coaching Kenny at the games in 2013, there was the workout that was like 27, 21, 15, 9 thrusters with like... Rope climbs? Rope climbs. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Froning was like the last one off the set of 27 thrusters. He takes that nice pause at the top of every thruster rep. He takes uh-huh. a breath. Big he breath. stays composed. He just rolled through that thing and made such quick work of it as if it was just like a casual walk in the park. Totally. And uh, Kenny actually did great on that workout as well, but just because just he's a freak at rope climbs. Yeah. But... um watching Froning do that that was like that's always stuck with me like how just composed he seemed the whole time and one of the things we preach in OPEX when we do like energy systems work and stuff like that is to not show pain on your face Uh huh. and that's really hard Fisher actually used to make fun of me all the time for my pain face yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> it was just so ugly yeah. I, I, I always was in the pain face the pain time. face and the old face are really close together <laughs> <laughs> they're basically the same thing <laughs> Yeah. So energy systems is another thing that like, you know, I learned in that 2013 time frame where, you know, you have like a lactic anaerobic on one spectrum and you have like super long aerobic on the other and just kind of the unique ways in which you can program those two energy systems to mesh over time, like over a 10 week cycle, you know, you start with one anaerobic uh, aspect and one aerobic aspect and you make your aerobic work a little more anaerobic and you make your anaerobic work a little more aerobic and suddenly these two things meet in the middle at like lactic power and lactic endurance and you have like a five to eight minute AMRAP and you've just like primed your body to succeed over the course of 10 weeks through manipulating these energy system cycles. And it's just really cool to be able to see the way that your body kind of adapts and responds to that. The scientific side of it is just so, so fucking interesting to me. Like thinking of training like that instead of just thinking of training like, okay, I did a uh, four or five back squat last week and I'm going to do a five, four, four ten back squat this week. You know what I mean? Like, there's so much more nowadays that we, like, understand. So I think it's just about applying it. And when you talk about stuff like that, I can geek out about that <laughs> all day long. It's like, so fun, man. so me too. fucking yeah. cool to me. It's interesting for me as an athlete, though, because I always wanted to get better. And I'd be like, all right, well, I want to do whatever OPEX is doing because that seems to be, like, the, he had a lot of great athletes and stuff. And then somebody would win who was, like, under Dusty Highland. Mm-hmm. Right? And Kenny started training with Dusty Highland. Yeah. And, like, um, who's the other girl that won? Lindsay. Lindsay was under Dusty. And then Valley of Elroy was under Dusty. Like, literally, like, there was, like, five people on the podium that were under Dusty. And I remember looking at his program, and I was like, this is death. Every day, it's death. Like, I didn't understand it. Uh-huh. And I'm like, what? What should I do? Well, should you, I die? Or should I do the smart thing? Or, like, should I do both? Or you like, make this point all the time, but... <laughs> Because whenever I geek out about OPEX, you always make the point like, well, but they don't have any fucking games athletes. Yeah. Like, they never had anybody big. Do you have an explanation for that? Why that's going on? I, I, don't, I don't think I do. Honestly, I think that at this point, there's a longevity component to it. Okay. Yeah. Hard that's what I, was I gonna, love that. Say, yeah. I fucking love that. Yeah. And like, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily want to train somebody that's going to be on the podium at the games. Uh-huh. I don't think that that's like my bread and butter right now. Okay. My whole thing with this like evolved training systems that I created is to get people to whatever their goal is to ensure longevity. Like my main target market right now, my clientele base is people that want to look like an athlete, feel like an athlete, still kind of train like an athlete, but they also want to feel good, sleep well have hormone balance, be able to eat a little bit of fun food every now and then, fun food. And, not, and not spend their entire life in the gym training. Yeah. Like, that is the evolved method as far as I'm concerned. And of all the remote clients that I work with, I would say 80% of them right now are on some version of this evolved training program. Okay. And then the other 20% are like still kind of diehard CrossFitters. So is there stuff that you do for your clients besides just writing the programming that involves like the sleeping pattern, the uh, getting out of the gym, food, like all that stuff? Is that just a big... 
So I kind of talked about this a little before the podcast too, right? Like I partnered with IN3 Nutrition okay. and Jason Phillips is CEO over there. He's an awesome dude. Um, he has a bunch of the nutritionists that work underneath him and I I originally started coaching one of them four or five years ago, Amanda Borelli. She's a six-time regional athlete here in SoCal and um, it was about 2015 that she started kind of getting burnt out on CrossFit and this is when I created my first like evolved program and it was a hybrid based program it involved Olympic lifting twice a week it involved um, Metcons at the end of each day like one Metcon a day but most of the day training was more bodybuilding focused so there'd be a day that was like I call it horizontal push pull but you can just think of that as chest back Okay, so <laughs> it's just a fancier term for it. it. I mean, it's it's a movement pattern system as opposed to a body part split. Got it. Yeah. Um, so then I also have like a, a leg day that's quad dominant and we have a leg day that's hamstring dominant. Okay, So cool. we separate that into like posterior and anterior sides. Uh, one day is more focused on squatting movements, getting below parallel. And then one day is more focused on hip hinging, hip extensions, good mornings, deadlifts, RDLs, things along those lines. And then we have one day that's a vertical push pull. Think of that as like shoulders, arms. Yeah. So vertical push pull, right? Shoulders, some pull ups, some dips, and then throw in like some bicep curls and some tricep extensions at the Love end. Love it to keep it fun. Yeah. And then on Saturday we had a gymnastics day, so it was a big day focused on like working on butterfly pull ups because all that other stuff is strict. So we're working on like muscle ups and butterfly pull ups and kipping handstand push ups gotcha. and stuff like that. So this was my very first kind of like evolved program. And she loved it. Not only did her hormone levels get better, she started sleeping better, feeling better in general, um, but she actually got stronger. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the biggest unique thing where she was just like, holy shit, there's this like other way out there. And so she was my kind of in to this um, IN3 nutrition group. And uh, a few months ago, I partnered up with Jason Phillips and now I'm training six or seven of his nutritionists and then his nutritionists are now sending me their clients that they work with. And all of these people have one thing in common, which tends to be they overtrained in CrossFit and now they need to get right. Yeah. And so they're all on some version. Kind of take of, a step back, slow down a little bit. Dude, exactly. And like I was talking to Fish about this earlier, but I'm training three times a week now, which is crazy. I never thought like when I had started on this CrossFit journey that I'd be the guy that's like, I'm just going to train three times a week for 60 to 90 minutes. And that's more or less what I'm doing. It's um, it's a movement pattern orientation program, like horizontal push pull, vertical push pull, stuff like that. And there's still some Metcon work in there. But instead of going out and killing yourself and doing Fran at the end of your workout, yeah, it's like three rounds of ten burpees and two hundred meter farmers carry. Gotcha. And so you're getting your conditioning Breathing in. Work. You're you're just doing work. Yeah. You're just keeping your body healthy and. So do you think you can do something like that, like the three days a week because you've achieved a certain baseline as an athlete? I know people talk about Pat Barber all the time too or Matt Chan mm -hmm. where they're like, well, Matt Chan only works out three days a week. And it's like, yeah, but fucking Matt Chan worked out for six years every single day. So he's achieved something. He's achieved a certain level of athleticism where now three days a week is enough for him to maintain that level. It's a great point. Yeah. And I think that the key is not that you have to have followed a high volume training program prior but more that you had to have put in enough time in the gym that your movement patterns don't need work. Yeah. Because this all goes back to the whole Froning thing where he's practicing movement. He's shooting free throws all the time, right? Yeah. It's muscle memory. That's what you're drilling, right? Yeah. Like, I don't need to work on my form and thrusters at this moment. Mm -hmm. I don't need to work on my chest to bar pull-ups. Like, I know how to do these things. Right. We've been in this game long enough that, like, this movement is almost second nature. It's like riding a bike. It comes back to you. It's like riding a bike, yeah. So I'm able to, I know at this point how to activate the proper muscles. Where training three times a week, I'm able to get enough stimulus to make it worthwhile. And I'm sure Matt Chan and Pat Barber are in the same boat. Um, they understand fitness on a level two where they can, just like you, you know what I mean? Where they know, okay, I'm only working on three days a week, but you know exactly what you're going to do in those three days yeah. to achieve the, the greatest effect. Exactly. I remember when I was on the Olympic bobsled team, that was our training. It was Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Seriously? That was it. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we would lift, like, we had a strength program. There was no conditioning in it. it was just a strength program in the morning, and then yeah. in the afternoon, we would push sleds. 
So we had like a, in the summertime, we'd have a, a wheel sled. And then in the winter, we'd have on the ice. Okay. But that was Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then um, I think I was on a Saturday or Sunday, the whole workout for the whole day was we would go to the track and do sprints. And it would be like, literally the whole day would be like a 10 by 100 meter sprint. Like that would be. Dude, that's exactly what it should be. I yeah. mean. And they weren't all out either. They no, were like, exactly. Because by the 10th one. Dude, if you went 100% on 10 by 100, the amount of decline that you would experience from sprint to sprint would be so significant. But dude, I used to be fucking so excited for like my days to squat and stuff. Because like, I had worked out Monday and then Tuesday's off. And then I'd work out. Wednesday and then the next day's off and I yeah. knew I was going to deadlift or whatever on Friday and I'd get wait. excited about that and then like the, at the whole weekend I'm like oh I can't wait till Monday I'm going to smash this you know <laughs> so and that yeah. it was like exciting but like right. now for me I mean well for me I like I have all these different injuries and stuff now but like sometimes like the thought of working out like isn't really like super exciting like it used to be so this is actually like another point that if your motivation in the gym is suffering maybe you start training less. Like, yeah. I noticed the same thing. I originally started on, you know, okay, I'm gonna go four days a week instead of five. But I found that training back-to-back -back days, I was not excited about my session on the second day in a row. And if you have high stress levels, like cortisol or something going on because you're not excited. Then, exactly, it's almost like point. you feel like you have to go into the gym to feel better. And that's the thing that I really am preaching for people to get away from is like, you should feel at your best and the workout should be something that you want to do. You shouldn't have to walk into the gym and be like, oh, I feel like shit today, my brain is so foggy, I just need to work out and I know I'm gonna feel better. Like, the amount of times that I've heard people say that, and the amount of times that I used to say that, right? It's all over the place. Yeah, but that's just not the point. Like, that's just not, it's not fun anymore, you know? No. And if, if, you, if you're like us and working out is such a big part of your life, then it should be an enjoyable part of your life. It shouldn't yeah. just be something that you dread every single day. I try to take every six to eight weeks, somewhere around there, I try and take a week off, but it's not really off. Like what I do is I go out of the gym, you know what I mean? I'm running, I'm biking, I'm swimming, playing basketball, playing beach volleyball, mm -hmm. whatever it is, and just staying outside the gym. I just did that a few weeks ago after the Open was over. I took like 10 days off. Fish and I went snowboarding the first weekend, and then after that it was just like running, biking, swimming, doing yoga, all that stuff. That's awesome. And after 10 days... You're fucking craving the barbell, yeah. right? You're yeah. like, oh my god, I want to pick up something heavy, like <laughs> yeah. right now. And that's that's what it should feel like every single day. I 100% agree, man. And the fact that you even are like aware enough to think of taking a week off every eight weeks. Yeah. More people could could do that. I, I always agree. say 12 to 16 weeks, mm -hmm. but yeah, if eight makes you feel better, like awesome. Right. And then you come back and you realize you didn't actually lose something. That's always the biggest fear. Is people are like, 100%, oh, yeah. if I take a week off, I'm going to lose all my gains. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's different. Like Because all of a sudden, yeah. now you're working out the right way. Now you're feeling good. Now you're yeah. making progress. You know. So I think that's cool. Um, as far as your online programming and like the remote client stuff goes, what do you do? Because there's a lot of options now out there for athletes, right? They can go... Google something and 100,000 pages are going to pop up. Yeah. What is something that you guys do to add value to your program over someone else's? So I do, um, I coach through private Facebook groups. I know other people do that too. Um, but I try to give them just the full experience. I give them full access to me. So within our Facebook group, I encourage them to post videos of their movement. Um, I make sure that any movements that I program that might not be, you know, the most obvious movements something kind of obscure maybe it's a bodybuilding movement or something like that i'll always either film my own video to demo for them or i'll link to a youtube video um another thing that is extremely time consuming but i find very productive is to actually help guide people through how they need to progress in their strength work because i find that to be one of the most confusing areas for people is you know i write okay we're gonna do five sets of three on your pull-ups Okay, well, what happens when I make five sets of three? Well, you try to increase weight. Okay, what if I can't increase weight? Okay, then now we're gonna try and increase weight the first set only, and then we're gonna try and hit the four remaining sets at your old weight, and then the next week we'll come in and do that. And like being able to manipulate volume and loading, being able to manipulate intensity in a way of like, okay, well, I've been doing this you know, for three weeks and I haven't made progress on it. How do we then attack that to individualize it to you and make sure that you can continue to progress from there? Um, whether it's like, like some days I've had people be like, okay, I'm not progressing on my five by three weighted pull-ups anymore. And I'm like, okay, today we're going to do 
five times max reps of just body weight, as many as you can do. Okay. And suddenly they're like, you know, achieving 60 to 75 reps. So you said you have around like 35 clients yeah. right now. Are you able to keep like one-on-one -on -one contact with all of them? Yeah. I mean, some of them require more attention than others. Like some of them yeah. actually really dig the, the individual communication and they're very diligent about posting their results every single training day and they, they crave the feedback from me. Mm -hmm. And then there are others that are much more self-sustainable and they kind of are just like, I got this, you know? Right, yeah. And they, and they yeah. only contact me when they're like stuck or when they feel like maybe they're starting to overreach and they're starting to feel a little less motivated. And, you know, then we'll have a kind of enlightened discussion about what do we need to do with your training volume? Maybe it's time to start kind of peaking this, this, um, this cycle and starting a new one. Um, I'm a hugely metric based coach. Mm -hmm. I, I strongly believe that there are certain movements in a program that need to repeat week to week to week so that you can tangibly see yourself getting stronger. And technically that's the CrossFit idea, right? I feel like that's something that's getting lost too. When I did my level one, that was one thing that they were preaching where basically you're trying to do five pull-ups, you're trying to do those five pull-ups as perfect as you possibly can. And the integrity of the movement comes before the intensity. Mm -hmm. Then after you do those five pull-ups, you add a sixth one. Now that sixth one may not be perfect now because you're kind of getting to the edge of being fatigued, right? So now you're going to train and keep going until that sixth one is perfect and then add seventh one. And you're just going to keep doing that and increase your lotus as it goes. But I think a lot of people have forgotten about that. And it, like I said earlier, it's like, okay, I snatched 225 last week. I'm going to snatch 235 this week. And it's like, well, dude, you fucking barely snatched 225. <laughs> right, 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 right. Like, that was not a good rep. Your knees caving in, your shoulders buckling. Exactly. There's yeah. a lot that you can fix at 225 before having to add weight. Yeah. I mean, there's so many good reasons to spend less time at sub-maximal loads. Mm -hmm. And people are all the time like, well, I snatched 225, so I'm going to snatch 235. Well, okay, what if we go back and now we spend a week or two snatching 205? Yeah, and we make on the 205 or, perfect right. or 185 perfect. And people think that if they don't go to a max every time they lift, that they're somehow going to get weaker. Yeah. Like, what the hell is that? Here's my view right now. <laughs> and you know what I'm about to say. Who fucking cares if you snatch these 35? Right. <laughs> right. Like, my mind is blown the fuck away. Like, I just don't care. Like, right. snatch 275, I don't care. You're like, irrelevant. Yeah. Like, what is the point? Unless you're going to the games, like, we have someone in our gym right now, like, she, she, it, it's a girl, and she's just, like, so obsessed with snatching, like, some number, I forget what it is, but I'm like, why? Like, Instagram, what? bro. Like, well, I, yeah. I mean, I, under, I understand, like, why you, like, I understand that, like, it would be cool, like, as a guy, like, you always want to snatch 300 pounds, you know? And, but it's just, like, there's a, there's a point where, like, if it's taking over your life, like, you're not doing anything else in your life but, like, focusing on snatching that 300 and working out all these different times and this and that, blah, 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 and then you snatch 300 and then yeah. what happens? At some point, it's like, it's enough too, you know what I mean? Like, it's fine, like, you're done. It's fine. The one thing that my ex-girlfriend always used to say to me, and I'm not a big fan of her anymore, but this was one thing. <laughs> <laughs> this was one thing that was one actually really funny. One time my ex-girlfriend was not a big fan of it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually really funny, because during that time, that was when I, like, started CrossFit, and I thought I was going to regionals, I thought I was going to games, like, it was, like, consuming my life, and I would come home, and I would tell her, like, oh my god, I clean jerked fucking 315 today. And she would always just look at me and she'd just be like, is it necessary to be lifting that much weight? <laughs> Isn't that just a typical uninformed girl? Yeah. Yeah. But at the, same yeah, time, is. at the same time, it's like, well, she's fucking right. Like, no, right. I'm never going to fucking pick up 315 and put it up over my head in yeah. any different scenario. Than <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Unless um, you start getting into fat girls, then there's... Oh, yeah. <laughs> fat but... girl, acro yoga. Oh. <laughs> that, that way you can progress as she gains weight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to keep feeding her. Every week. Oh, man. That's wrong. Um, but <laughs> so going back to like talking about like working out at submaximal loading, like the amount of times that I've seen people just, you know, hang out at like 75, 80% and do perfect reps. And I won't even let them touch a one rep max or even close to a one rep max for weeks upon weeks. And then they go back and we're like, okay, now you're going to test your one rep max. And they do their one rep max and they're like, oh my God, that was so easy, you know? And you're just like, yeah, because your form is so much better. You didn't miss reps for like eight straight weeks. Yeah. And like when you fail, you teach your body failure. You don't teach your body to succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I teach people only lifting specifically, like I teach them that like 
it should feel like you should feel like you know what you did wrong. Like if when I'm done coaching yeah. you at the end of the like if I do like a one on one session with someone for only lifting, like at the end of that hour, if you feel like you still need me as far as like where the bar was, like I didn't do a good job mm-hmm. on coaching you. Yeah, and it goes back to the active meditation too. I think like visual visualization is mm-hmm. such a huge key to me. Like I kind of come in contact with that when I was still playing football and a lot of people, successful people always talk about that. You got to see yourself succeed before it actually happens. Absolutely. And I go through that all the time in the gym when it comes to lifts. Dude, I haven't missed a clean in, I don't, I don't know how long, two or three years. And I'm that feels joking. great, right? You know what I mean? Like I haven't failed. I hit 365 during that open workout, which was a 20 pound PR. Wow. And it's just like, I don't know how to fail a clean anymore. You know what I mean? Like I don't know what you that just feels teach like. Success. Yeah. And on snatch, that's a hundred percent not the case. I go, I get to like ninety percent on my snatch, and I'm like, oh, I don't know what the fuck's gonna happen here, right? But it's so that's I think I've never thought of it like that. But the way you said it, you know what I mean? You're teaching your body failure on my snatch. I failed so many times that I kind of go in and I'm like, ah, I might hit this, I may not. You know what I mean? On my clean, I'm so certain. that It's I'm, a confidence that issue. You just, yeah. you just know, like I'm gonna pick this bar up and I'm gonna stand this up, and, and I'm exactly out of my mind. Like, I, yeah. I, I know I'm going to snatch a lot of weight, yeah. and I'm pretty sure I'm not going to clean anything. I mean, I think ultimately it comes down to just working at weights that allow you to make reps. Mm-hmm. Like, going back to the Rich Froning, like, 135 snatches for three reps on the minute forever. Like, like yeah. I, I, don't, I, I did one squat clean on the minute for an hour one time a few years ago. I was just like, I'm just going to do one a minute. Every rep's gonna be perfect, For and I'm gonna hour. try and it exactly it was oh stupid. I, no, an hour was bad. This was this was in the pre. Like, I told you, dude, he was always dying. Pre enlightened days. Yeah, um, <laughs> dude, you got to do some dumb shit every now. No, exactly. And then, I'm so happy about dumb shit. Did the fucking iron triathlon? Remember the going one up to twenty? Yeah, oh, yeah. I did that the next day after. Linda, you, or did I do it the day before you? It took me an hour fifty-five, bro. Wow. Yeah, that's so stupid, right? And it's so it's dumb, like, and it's like, all right, I did. It. I just wanted to do it's it. Like some of those twelve days of Christmas workouts out there. I remember you and I went into the gym one Christmas, and it was the day after we did a 12 days of Christmas workout, and we decided to test our one rep max barbell curl. Oh, Do you remember this? Oh, my God. I think I still have the video on my computer. (laughs) And I hit 165 strict. Wow. No momentum. It was just like, boom. And then you tore a rib or something. I popped a rib out. (laughs) Bro, I was laid up for like 10 days. My worth I, it. I can worth barely it. breathe, dude. I want to say he might have bicep curled one eighty five. It was like so savage Why, that dude? all of us were like, "What?" Like we, I hadn't even done a bicep curl in years, and I saw him do it. I think it was one sixty five or one seventy five, but whatever it was, That's it, a lot of fucking weight. Dude, it was dude, a lot. It popped curl. a rib out, and I was <laughs> I was so laid up for so long, That's man. So awesome. I think my. Overall, like, dumbest workout I've ever done was with this guy, Paul Smith. You remember him? Yeah, the, the, dude. the dude out of Texas, right? Yep. He hits me up and he's like, I'm coming to stop by uh, this gym I used to work out. He's like, I got this workout in mind. We're going to do 100 power cleans at 225 with five burpees on the minute. Oh. You're like calcium. It's a super with, calcium, yeah. yeah. With power cleans. And yeah. I was like, oh, okay, you know. Little did I know, like, we start after like three rounds. I'm like, oh, I'm doing like sets of three or four on the minute. And I'm like, oh my God. And then, like, the, like later on, we started getting to the point where, we're, like, him and I both did, like, one. Like, yeah, I watched just five burpees. <laughs> and then I watched him, like, take a minute off. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, he's really good, dude. And he's massive. Uh-huh. And he took us, like, 30 minutes and we finished. Yeah. No matter what I did the rest of that week, it felt like I tried to squat, like, 135, like, warming up. And I was like. Your nervous system was just so shy. I, I, exactly. I, I yeah. just knew. I was like, I can't do this. Like, I literally, I know I can't squat. Yeah. And then, like, the next day, I come and try to work out. I was like. I can't work out. The CNS impact of high volume Olympic lifting is so gnarly. Yeah. But that was the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life for sure. The dumbest thing I ever done was actually before CrossFit, my buddy and I were like working out for football when I was playing semi-pro in Germany. And um, we were doing, uh, what is it called, West Side Barbell for Skinny Bastards. Right? (laughs) They had like an extra, like for Skinny Bastards program in there. It was like a bunch of like benching. It It was actually pretty cool stuff. And then one day, the cash out was 100 calf raises. So they had like the little calf raise machine, you know, yeah. with like the pads going on your shoulders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we went pretty light. I think it was like the three stacks or something like that. And I did 100 calf raises. Dude, I couldn't walk for a week. I had to take two days off of practice 
because I literally got to practice them. Like, there's no fucking way I can run right now. <laughs> Dude, it got to the point where, like, I, whenever I would stand up off a couch, right? Yep. I'd, like, stand up like this and, and then, then push press on yep. my knee yep. just to, like, straighten my leg. Yep. Dude, oh my it was God. so fucking terrible. I'm like, yeah, I'm done with this fucking program. I'm not doing this ever again. Wow. <laughs> the same thing happened to me on my college tour. I did 100 calf raises right before I had to go tour University of Cincinnati. <laughs> and I literally couldn't walk. Yeah. So they had to give me a golf cart to go to. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. I love it. I know. So this is actually a perfect segue talking about stupid shit. Where do you see you're at the forefront of CrossFit? You're one of the first like CrossFit in San Diego. You're one of the first people to like start online programming. Where do you see the CrossFit world or if you want to go fitness world in general, where do you see it like evolving over the next 5, 10, 15 years? Such a big question. I'll Um, take 15 years out. Let's go 5, 10. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, you know, CrossFit is a tough one because all the weights just are going to keep getting heavier and all the gymnastics movements are going to get more complicated. Mm -hmm. Like all of the gymnastics stuff has to turn into like grid style stuff, right? I mean, there just is no more evolution of, of, of gymnastics work. Yeah. Or it becomes more of like actually Olympic style gymnastics. I would love to watch them degress and go back down to like classic CrossFit with like lighter weights and see just what happens. I think it'd be so much cooler, but... I think what's going to be cool too to see is... If you look at Matt Fraser, he's so dominant right now. When he started CrossFit, when he was how old is he now? He's I think he started when he was like mid twenties. So he was a weightlifter, right? He was a little yeah. weightlifter, and then he like started like mid twenties. So like he started CrossFit in mid twenties. There's kids that are starting CrossFit now when they're fucking eight years old. Oh yeah, you know what I mean. So when those kids get to like 18, 19, yeah. 21... a lot of times though they get burned out. Yeah. Or injuries occur. I mean, your body can only handle so much like heavy volume, high load work. That's true. That's so I point. think as far as evolution goes, like. People longevity. need to train smarter. Yeah, you need to focus on yeah. longevity, especially if you're going to start it younger. Like, Fisher's been, you know, killing himself in Olympic training and CrossFit training for over a decade, yeah, and not. now he can't squat anymore. <laughs> and, like, I tore a labrum in 2012 because I decided that I wanted to go on an Olympic lifting cycle and do CrossFit. And, like, these are things that are just so dumb, and you didn't know any better when you're younger, but if you do shit long enough, you're going to get injured. It's a sport. You play football. Like, right. you play football long enough, you will get injured. 100%. And, like, if you're going to be good at CrossFit in years to come... You're going to get injured. You're going to get injured, but you need to be smart about what you're putting in. Like, isn't an hour, five days a week for 30 years better than four hours a day, six times a week for four years? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like... And the whole longevity factor, what you were saying before we started recording, too, at the end of the day, and what Fisher was saying, too, like, who the fuck cares if he's not 225 or not? At the end of the day, like, you want to be able to pick up your kids and play catch and, you know, not exactly. have to fucking sit on the sidelines and just watch them grow up. Well, what I think is really cool is a couple of years ago, well, I guess in May 1st, my gym will be open for four years, and um, I remember, like, when I first opened the gym, I started this thing called Sweat, which was, like... You know, you, you know it, obviously. Yeah. It's more of like a conditioning class. The way that I started it, which which uh, to like what it is now, is like so much different. I feel like it's evolved into like just so many cooler workouts in my opinion. But the amount of people that are like, I really want to come in and do sweat today is just getting like more and more and more and more and more. And yeah. I remember at that time, I was telling him about my sweat class and he had started a bodybuilding class in his CrossFit gym. Oh, dope. And people were digging it, right? Yeah, we actually still have a, a version of it now. Yeah. Called Strong. Yeah. So, like, he started bodybuilding stuff. Like, There's way dudes before. at Chalk that would dig that for sure. Like, we oh, always yeah. do, do the fucking bro downs after class. So, yeah. like, I feel like that would take off too. I know. I thought about putting that in there at yeah. some point. So, like, I was going to say, like, my. I think you're going to start seeing a lot more, like, bodybuilding style stuff, like, in the CrossFit workouts type of stuff. But. What do you think? Yeah, that's, that's a perfect segue into, like, the strong program that we have on our gym because you know we have a very crossfit based membership and even when we had the bodybuilding program in like 2013 14 15 when i did the men's physique comp um it wasn't like taking off like you wanted it to no it wasn't really taken off like certain people did it and then it was mostly new people that came in that were like "Eh, i'm scared of crossfit but i'll try this bodybuilding program so now i reintroduced the program called strong um probably like six seven months ago and it's not nearly as much of a focus on like a pure bodybuilding program as much as like a hybrid between strength training, 
bodybuilding and CrossFit style, like Metcon stuff, like I was saying, like 200 meter farmers carry and 10 burpees for three rounds or something like that. So now it's like actually taken over the gym and we've had oh, a so yeah. number of different people from the CrossFit classes that are like, I'm just going to do this program now because they feel, they feel like they have all the components that they want in one program where they have the aesthetic component of the bodybuilding. They have the strength component from the powerlifting side of things. Like I always program the squats and deads um, in a lower rep range. Like, you know, we alluded to earlier, like three to five reps. Got the hypertrophy stuff in there, like the eight to 15 rep stuff. And then we have the little... What do you do for hypertrophy? All right, so let's... Uh, a perfect... I'll just go over like one of the programs from, from this past week. So it was horizontal push-pull day. So we went... Uh, bench press and bent over rows for sets of six to eight. So that was more of like our strength work for the day. And then we had dumbbell bench press and dumbbell crock rows. And those were for uh, 10 to 12 reps. And then we did some supersets, uh, one or two sets of dumbbell flies with ring rows. And then the workout at the end was 200 meter farmer's carry, 30 burpee deadlifts with your kettlebells and then 30 Russian kettlebell swings. Nice. So that's the whole thing, right? You got your strength work, your hypertrophy work, you got your little Metcon at the end. Yeah, you get a little bit of sweat at least at the end. Like exactly. That. And it's not like, dude, I was dead after the crock rows. Like picking up a 110 pound dumbbell and rowing that shit 15 times is like... What the fuck's a crock row? It's like a, a dumbbell bent over row, but instead of your knee being on the bench, you're holding like a stack of plates for support so you can get a little more momentum in there. Oh, okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Get a little lat extension and lat contraction. <laughs> gotcha. Um, and then like on the squat day, like today I came into your gym and I was doing our, our strong program. So it was uh, work up to a heavy triple for back squat and then three sets of three at 10% less. So I'm big into the back offsets now, like one heavy set and then a bunch of back offsets where you're just kind of working on form, efficiency, breathing, active meditation. There you go. <laughs> um, and then after that, we did some split squats. So it was like 15, 12, 10, 8, 6, something like that. So you get all the kind of rep range zones there. And then we throw in, uh, I can't remember exactly what the, the hypertrophy work after that was, but it was something like lunges and GHD sit-ups. Okay. Um, so you just kind of get a good mix of everything. Like you get a little bit of CrossFit at the end, you get your strength work, your hypertrophy work, and it's kind of like this super program. And everyone, we've had a lot of people kind of veer off the CrossFit path and start doing that recently. And they love it. They actually feel like they're getting more volume in than they do with CrossFit. I can see that. I so, really like stuff like that. I, I, and I've been doing a lot of stuff like that. And yeah. I'm, I really like, uh, personally, I like the, um, like the Pat O'Shea stuff from back in the seventies, the, uh, the IWTs. IWTs. Yeah. I yeah. love the IWTs because I still have that part of me that wants that death feeling just because I don't know. That's just kind of like my DNA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I really like endurance. Like I really like, like it sucks that I can't run anymore cause my knee's so fucked up, but I love to just like. Get on the bike and put in like a hundred calories or get on the ski and put on like a hundred calories or do like a huge workout. But now I try to make a lot of that stuff make a little bit more sense where it's kind of like an IWT. Yeah. For those of you guys who don't know, it's like interval weight training and it's usually a lifting component and a cardio component with some rest. Program. I think if you're going to kill yourself, That's it's way, to way it. better to do it for your CNS on a piece of cardio equipment than it is with a mixed modal training. Yeah, for sure. We do a lot of cardio. It's easier to handle, for sure. In the gym. Yeah. And you can recover from that. And, like, you know, you're not going to end up in a CNS depleted state by doing 1,000 meter repeats on the rower. No. Like, it's just cardio. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of the cardio stuff, too. Like, it's still going to suck, but. You, you can do cardio stuff every day. Like, just, you know, Absolutely. If you're yeah. a track athlete, you're if That's doing... something you want to do. Yeah. Track athletes also periodize, though. And they that's, do. like, you know, one of the aspects of CrossFit that, that is, is now in instituted, but could be focused on a little bit more is the fact that like you're not going 100% all the time. You're periodizing your training out a little bit and track athletes are the same way. Like like you kind of said earlier, you know, you have one day where you're doing 100 meter repeats and a lot of the other days are lower intensity work, form work and stuff like that, shooting free throws. Yeah, train smarter, not harder. Yeah. yeah, 100%. Dude, some of my days would be 10, 10 by 30 meter sprint. Yeah. That'd be it. It's just a takeoff basically. It's really not yeah. a huge day. That was the day. I know. But then you can really focus on a takeoff. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you're not you're not exhausted, you're not 
you're you're still there you're not blacking out you know you can yeah. you're, you're feeling every step and you're just a lot more connected to what you're doing anything else you want to add um i i do like kind of like where where we're kind of getting to from like what you started with the gym and then like where we think everything is going to kind of go and then what do you been what do you like to do personally now after all these years like basically kind of like your strong program yeah exactly i I really like to have a little mix of everything like i really truly enjoy squatting and deadlifting heavy i also enjoy cleaning heavy i think those three things are going to be staples for as long as my body can do it and i don't always go heavy like i like to you know have my back off weeks and i think i think every out of every month i like to have at least one week where i deload um all those movements and then i feel like i am able to at this point in my life spend three weeks going heavier. Um, I don't know if that's going to stay forever when I'm 45. It might be two weeks heavy and two weeks deload. But whatever it is, I'm going to continue doing those three movements heavy because I really enjoy them. Um, And I enjoy doing some of that like farmer's carries and more of like kind of strongman conditioning stuff. And uh, I enjoy hypertrophy work because... Dude, it still makes me breathe heavy. You get the pump. Dude, you get the pump. Chase the pump, Chase the pump, man. (laughs) We live at the beach, like all of us. Like yeah. I live in Pacific Beach. You guys live in Newport. Like we're walking around with our shirts off all the time. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's cool to be sore in that way, and the and it's way it's always beach season too. It's always beach season. Yeah. <laughs> the way that I get sore doing that type of training is real good soreness as opposed to CNS fatigue. Yeah, and you can feel the difference. So for me, it's all about avoiding CNS fatigue. If I do something stupid like an open workout, which I did do the open this year, or you know, 12 days of Christmas or Murph or whatever, because those things come up and they're part of the community. And they're fun. And they're fun. I'm definitely going to take two days off after that. Like, I'm not going to be that kid that comes in and does a one rep max barbell curl the next day. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> no. It's just crazy. I, I think the hardest part is trying to get these people to just... Slow down. Not even slow down. <laughs> like, just, like, get them to believe that something else is going to work for them. Yeah. I get so bummed. Like, sometimes I'll program for the gym, like... I had an Olympic total like a week ago and I was like, we're going to do one rep max snatch, one rep max clean and jerk. And then like, I'd be totally cool with like that, but I have to put thousand meter row in there at the end. Cause people need to breathe heavy, right? Cause they have to have right. it. So if, it'll be, it's, you had 15, you had 30 minutes for a one rep max snatch and a clean and jerk. And then it was a, at the end, everybody went and we did a thousand meter row for time. But it's like, there is, and this is kind of like where I always talk about when it comes to programming, like there is that like you have to please the crowd type of thing. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like you could be a Your really... gym members, yeah. yeah. You could be a great musician, but if you suck on stage, you know what I mean? Like no one really wants to watch you play. Yeah. So a good analogy. There is like a little bit of that, like for the gym owners out there and all that stuff. Like, But also doing it in a way where it's still fun and not like, you know, taking you the fuck down and you feel like you're dead all the time. So I think there's a, there's a very interesting way to program for your gym and then what's really right and... I think what everyone should be doing, though, is cycling different programs all the time. Mm-hmm. I think that's, like, the most important thing. you got to keep it interesting. you got to keep your members safe. And you got to give them something that they look forward to doing. Yeah. And you got to educate yourself because the more I learn about working out, the more I understand, the more I want to try new things. And oh, like, my God, yeah. You know what I mean? The more I – and the better I feel – outside of the gym too you know just going in and just murdering yourself is one thing but the more you understand you're like oh wow I can actually feel good and make progress Mm -hmm. at the same time let's do that it's the perfect world man that's why I always preach for everybody out there to try different gyms yeah like if you're not really sure if your program's that good like how many times do you hear people say like oh my gym's programming is shit but like I just love everybody there or like or that gym's programming is shit or whatever you know what I mean it's like I think you should. I think everyone should try every gym in their area for a week and see if they like it, and, and kind of and like try different classes, try different coaches, try different programs. Like if, if you're in San Diego and you go to a regular CrossFit gym, try a strong program and see if you like it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like try different things and see if you like it because you don't know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Feel that. Um, all right. So I think this is the part where you talk about where people can find you and your programs and all. Totally. Stuff you know. EvolvedTradingSystems.com. That's my website. I'm on Instagram at Brian Borstein. Jim is San Diego Athletics slash CrossFit PB. And you also post daily workouts on B's crew. I do, yeah. I post uh, daily CrossFit workouts at B's crew training on Instagram. Got two of those handles, B's crew and Brian Borstein. Dude, 
Thanks so much for having me. This is rad. Very easy to find this guy for sure. Definitely. And if you're ever cruising down Garnet Avenue in Pacific Beach, you guys can go check out the gym. It's a huge spot. It's a cool spot. John Cena has been known to work out there a few times. Hell yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, yeah, yeah. You got anything to add? No, not really. I'm excited to go to Paleo FX with you next week. Yep. Uh, We're going to be out there, probably get some cool interviews, meet some cool people. So there's a lot of good content coming your way. Um, So, yeah, I'm excited for that. All right, guys. Awesome. That's it. That's the end of the show. Later. All righty, then. That's going to wrap it up with Brian. Hope you guys had fun, learned a thing or two, got a couple good bit of laughs in there. Uh, We definitely had a great time with Brian. And as always, guys, if you like it, now that the channel is so new and we're trying to prove ourselves, make sure you follow the Shrug Collective and subscribe. Make sure you guys leave a review. And as always, guys, Fish and I are super um, interested in what you guys are trying to do or what you guys want to hear more of. So any ideas, any comments, any concerns you guys have, either send us an email. It's going to be Yaya or Ryan at CrossFitChalk.com. Uh, our Instagrams are at Yaisview, at Ryan Fish. We really try to get back to everybody that sends us a message. So let us know your thoughts what topics you want to hear about, what guests you want to have on. Uh, If you want to see more pictures of Ryan with his shirt on or off, whatever it is, we're going to do our best to make it happen just for you guys. So tell your mom, tell your mom's friends, tell everybody the Real Chalk Podcast. I'm Yaya and I'm out.